We're also, we have NASA's chief scientist, Ellen Stofan here, and she's also gonna be here later for the panel we have, but she has brought her daughter, which is what this is all about. We're so glad to have you here. Hey. Hi, my name is Ellen Stofan. I'm the chief scientist of NASA. I'm a planetary geologist by training, so I study volcanoes on Venus, Mars, uh, Earth. Uh, and one of the moons of Saturn. But as chief scientist of NASA, I get the fun of looking across all of the science that we do at NASA, from studying the sun, solar flares, uh, studying the universe, what's the nature of black holes, why are there black holes at the centers of galaxies, uh, you know, what's the, what happened at the very early stages of formation of the universe, um, studying all the planets. And one of the main reasons we study the planets is actually to turn back and look at our own planet. That's why I study volcanoes around the solar system. To look back at our planet and say, how do volcanoes work? You know, why are there earthquakes? How can we better predict these phenomena on the surface of our own planet? Um, and then, of course, Earth science. We actually have 19 satellites in orbit around the Earth right now, um, studying every aspect of this very complicated, very, very complicated planet. The other part of science that I think Katie talked about um, probably a little bit today is all the science we do studying humans up on the International Space Station, uh, looking at all aspects of human health because it takes eight months to get to Mars, eight months to get back. And when you take our bodies out of this 1G environment that we evolved in, your body doesn't operate very well. And so we need to find ways to mitigate those effects. So you can say, okay, all that science you guys are off there doing at NASA, how does that affect me? Why am I here? Um, well, part of it is just that scope I was talking about, that enormous scope of science that we're doing. And frankly, you know, a lot of the public doesn't, doesn't even know what we're doing. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me um, when the space shuttle retired and say, oh, sorry, you lost your job. I'm like, I didn't lose my job. We still have NASA. We still have astronauts every day up on the International Space Station doing work. Um, and part of our issue is that we have all this data. Like take our Earth science data, for example. You know, for obviously for decades, we've been gathering data about this planet. That data has predominantly gone to scientists who want to understand, you know, what are the implications for climate change? How does the surface of the Earth operate? But at this point, because of, of the extreme severity of climate change and the effect it's gonna have on this planet over the next 30 years, it's become really critical for us to get that data into the hands of people other than scientists. So we need to get our data into the hands of, say, town planners you know, who might, might work in a coastal town in the United States that's gonna face severe storm surge and flooding over the next 20 years. We need to get our satellite data into the hands of farmers who are in drought areas and who need to know which of my fields has moister soil and so which one should I plant or which one should I harvest. As a country, we need to be monitoring crops in other countries to say which of those countries might be facing famine and how can we help before it gets to a crisis mode. So when you look at these app challenges that we have for this weekend, a lot of that is aimed at how can we get this immense amount of NASA data, harness the power of all the citizens to help us figure out how can we get this data into the hands of people other than scientists? How can we make it useful to everybody? And we can't do that on our own. You know, we're stronger together. And, and one of the reasons, I love everything that I was hearing today about what you guys have accomplished today because it reminds me actually of why I love working at NASA. Everything we do is about teamwork. It's about bringing people together whose skills are different than your skills. It's about having people approach a really tough problem, whether it's climate change or how to get humans down onto the surface of Mars. Um, everybody built, brings different skills. One of my chief concerns at NASA right now is, you know, I hope no one's tweeting this. You know, when I go into a meeting, I look around the room and most of the people in the room don't look like me. So to me, it's so important to bring all of you into our NASA family, to get all of you excited about technology, to make you realize that you're so capable and necessary to solving the tough problems that we have. Because if we only have 50% of our population, not to be mean to white guys, but if we only have 50% of our population or less trying to solve these really tough challenges we have in front of us, I don't think we're gonna solve them. So we need to harness the power of women 
we need to harness the power of all the groups that are not represented. And it's not just diversity for diversity's sake. It's because we need everybody's talent. And we need everybody to feel that they have the talent and have the confidence to say, I'm going to contribute. I'm going to help NASA figure out how to get astronaut data better, better out to the public so that we can all understand. And I hate to tell you this, I'm sure Katie mentioned it, but actually we can keep the astronauts a lot healthier if they just exercise regularly and eat right. How disappointing is that, right? It's what we're supposed to do here on Earth also. Um, but that kind of information, you know, we can all train like an astronaut and get healthier. You can help us look at our water quality data and figure out how to get that out into the hands of people. But we need everybody's help. And so I'm so excited you guys are here today. And I hope you're going to stay all weekend and, and help us develop some of these apps because they are actually really important. We're not doing this stuff just for, oh, this is a good thing to get people to do. Our citizen science projects are really important to us in terms of really helping us to get everybody involved in trying to get NASA's data out to be more useful. So I'm happy to answer questions on anything from NASA policies, life in the universe, which I've been a little notorious on in the last few days. Um, anything you guys want to ask a question about? How, how did you get into being um, NASA's like top scientist? Like, did you like, what was, I what, don't know, I still haven't figured that, that out. Like, <laughs> road. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I always, it's always weird to me when people ask me that because um, my father worked for NASA. So I went to my first launch when I was four. Um, the rocket actually blew up on the launch pad. It was unmanned, but that's probably why I didn't end up like uh, Katie being an astronaut. But um, um, I was just always around it. My mom was a science teacher and I was one of these kids who just picked up rocks. In fact, I mean, Sarah, Sarah my daughter who's here, she's studying Russian and politics at the University of Edinburgh. So she's not a science person, but we'll forgive her. Um, <laughs> Sarah can tell you, at some points, my husband will look at me and say, do we have to have rocks in every room of the house? And the answer to that is yes, we have to have rocks in, in every room of the house. Um, so I was just a kid who always really liked science. And, and for me, it was really important to have role models to look up to. So I looked at people like Mary Leakey, who was you know, discovering human origins in Africa, Jane Goodall studying chimps, um, and then eventually Sally Ride being an astronaut and thinking those women succeeded. Those women belong in science and technology. I can, I can belong too. Um, and then I started out as a geologist and I worked on a bunch of NASA missions, um, a mission to Venus. Uh, I worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California um, for years. And then I took a bunch of years and worked part time and taught at a university while my kids were growing up. And then I was working on a mission. Um, it was to send a boat um, to a sea at the North Pole of one of, Tit of one of Saturn's moons called Titan. It actually rains on this moon, even though it's way out in the solar system. Um, there's a complete water cycle, but because it's so far out in the solar system, um, the fluid isn't water. It's actually basically like liquid gasoline. It's methane and ethane. So it evaporates up into the atmosphere, rains back onto the surface, and forms rivers and seas. So I proposed a mission to send a boat um, to NASA, and it made it through the first stages, and then we got, um, then we got turned down. And I was really disappointed, um, and I was feeling like my life is over. Um, and I was really bummed out, because this mission was a really cool mission scientifically. And then one day I got a phone call, and they said, do you want to interview to be chief scientist of NASA? And I said, well, okay. It's not, just, it's not the job I wanted, but it, I'll take it. So it's really fun. So what do you love most about your job? Um, you know, this is going to sound hokey, but the thing I love the most is, is doing things like this. Katie and I just spent about 12 days in South Africa traveling around, talking to students. Um, I travel around a lot in the U.S. talking to students. Um, that, that is probably the most fun part of my job, is when I get to get out and talk to people, because it reminds me, sometimes, you know, when you're sitting in a budget meeting in Washington worrying about NASA's budget, or, you know, what are we going to do next? How can we try to do all these things you want to do in a short period of time? That can get frustrating. And sometimes you think, uh, you know, is, is this worth it? And then when I go out and I talk to groups, it, it reminds me that, that what we're doing is so fundamentally cool. We're trying to understand how our planet works. We're trying to understand how the universe works. We're trying to get humans to explore beyond the boundaries um, of our planet out to Mars. Um, and so when I get to go out and talk about that, it, it reminds me, oh, right. 
And I get to meet all these cool people who do cool things like Katie. So, oh, sorry, um, I got the mic just for the moment. So yeah, extraterrestrial life, you know, uh, three part question, why are you notorious? Um, what do we know and when will we know it? Um, it, it, it's that latter part. We, we had an event at NASA on Tuesday. It was really fun. We had it at NASA headquarters. And it was um, the, the guy who runs our science mission director at John Grunsfeld, um, Jim Green, Jeff Newmark, and Paul Hertz. And they run our different science directorates in planetary science, heliophysics, which is studying the sun, and astrophysics. And we were talking about the fact that over the last year or so, NASA's been making these really fundamental discoveries about water all around not just our solar system but the universe. Now water is critical because we think that water is critical for the evolution of life. And it's not just because life here on Earth has water associated with it. Um, but we actually think there are unique properties of the water molecule. The fact it has this polarity, the fact that it's a solvent for so many things, um, the fact it has this great surface tension, all of those things we think were really important when life evolved here on Earth. So maybe they're also important for the evolution of life on planets around other stars, for other planets in our solar system. So we had a press conference because we know water was stable on the surface of Mars for a long time. So we're looking really hard right now on Mars for what we call habitable environments. Where are places where life could have taken hold? Can we find evidence of organic molecules that might tell us that something went down the path towards life in those places? We're finding organic molecules in interstellar clouds. We're finding them basically everywhere. So we know those building blocks of life are everywhere. With our Kepler Space Telescope in the last few years, we've discovered over a thousand new planets around other stars. And now we're starting to find, we've found a, about a half dozen planets about the size of Earth in what we call the habitable zone, which means the distance from their parent star where w liquid water should be stable on their surface. So basically, we're on the verge of really being able to address that question of are we alone in the universe, something people have, wor I think, wondered about ever since there were people. Um, all those planets we've discovered from Kepler, um, Kepler was looking at a little tiny portion of the night sky. So it's basically telling you every star you see in the night sky probably has planets around it. So all of a sudden you say, okay, in our own solar system, we have all these targets, we know where to go, we know what to measure, and we're on a path to do it. We're developing better and better telescopes to study planets around other stars. And so at the end of this meeting, somebody said, okay, would you speculate about when we're gonna do this? So I went out on a limb and I said, that I maintain that within 10 years, we're gonna see strong indications of life on another planet. Now, does that mean we're gonna have detected life? Nothing that won't be really controversial in the scientific community. And scientists love to argue, and scientists love to criticize each other. Don't believe what you hear the politicians say. We actually cannot stand to agree with each other. So I think we're gonna find intriguing signs on Mars that point towards life having evolved there. I think we're gonna get more data from the atmospheres of planets around other stars. And then I think it's gonna take on the order of probably 20 to 25 years to actually confirm it, where the scientific community will say, yes, indeed, we all agree, um, this is evidence for life on another planet. The main thing we're gonna struggle against is all these forms of life we're looking at for in our own solar system um, are probably gonna be microbial. Again, think back to the Earth. The Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago. By about 3.8 billion years ago, life had evolved, so pretty rapidly. Life remained in the ocean for billions of years. And it took well over a billion years for it to get anything more complicated than a little multicellular microbe. So that means when we go to other bodies in our solar system, the moons of Jupiter that have these ice, uh, oceans underneath their icy crusts like Europa, or Mars, we're looking for microbes. And those are going to be hard to find. And, and that's why I think it's going to take as long as a decade. But I guess because I put a specific year on it, I got a lot of press coverage, which I'm like, well. So I wanted to ask you, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, you know, my days are usually really fun because um, I'm trying to think like what I did um, 
yesterday. You know, I'll, I'll have a meeting with maybe um, somebody in the morning talking about a new citizen science project because my office, um, as chief scientist, we've really been, I've been trying to gather a lot of the citizen science we do at NASA. Like, we have this really cool program called Disk Detective. It's on Zooniverse where you can go and help us classify stars as to whether they're most likely to have dust disks around them. Um, now, that's important because those are the stars most likely to have um, planets. And we actually take the top candidates and do follow-on that the public classifies. We take them and do follow-on research on these stars. So, and that rose up really organically. Just a scientist at NASA thought, you know, wow, I need help looking at this data. So I I'm going to create this project. I want to take citizen science to the next level. I want to promote it. I want to make sure scientists think of it first, not as an afterthought. Um, I want to make sure we're, we're getting the public involved in the most exciting things we're doing, like the journey to Mars. How can we harness everybody to help us with that? Um, so I might have a meeting about that. Then I might have a meeting with somebody about our latest findings on in astrophysics. Then I'll go to a budget meeting. Um, <laughs> Um, I meet, my, meet with Deborah. Deborah and I work a lot together in terms of how can we take this NASA data and involve, um, for example, there was something we had last year called the Climate Data Initiative, where um, with, we were working with the White House to get out um, a lot of our climate data and climate data from across the government um, uh, uh, more easily accessible by the public. Um, just yesterday, I had a meeting with a, a woman from uh, the U.S. Air Force who's a test pilot who wanted to understand what NASA was doing with women in STEM and how maybe we could work together. Um, and then I, I went and met with our NASA headquarters women's group um, that's trying to do more for women at NASA and trying to make sure um, that our careers are being advanced and that we have kind of a support group. Everybody needs a support group. Um, and then I usually meet with the NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden, who's the most amazing, wonderful guy, six-time shuttle astronaut. Um, who really does a great job of, of leading NASA. And, and he and I will talk about sort of science policy overall, but lately it's been a lot about STEM education um, and how we can really use NASA um, in the best way to really further STEM education because I think we do a lot with the inspiration point about getting kids interested in science. What frustrates me is then I see kids, especially in middle school or high school, thinking, I can't do this, or this is hard, or this isn't for me, or I don't see people like me doing this. And that's the part I really want to attack, because um, we need everybody. And if we only have the people coming to help us who, who think they belong, we're in trouble. Um, and so that's why, that's one of the reasons I'm here.